Hi, this is Joe Clark, composer of The Cowl Sessions, and you are listening to the GeekCast Radio Network. Hello and welcome to a GeekCast Radio Network crossover interview between the Pull Bag and the flagship show GeekCast Radio. I am your host, Mike TFG1 Blanchard, and the reason why this is being featured on both GCR and the Pull Bag feed is because my guest this evening is someone who composed and arranged a jazz soundtrack album for a comic book series. I am talking to Joe Clark of the Joe Clark Big Band. Hello, sir. Hi, Mike. How are you doing? I am doing well. How are you, sir? Oh, I'm doing real well. Thank you. Yeah, I follow Kyle Higgins on Twitter and pretty much everywhere else that I can find him. No, I'm not stalking (laughs) him, ladies and gentlemen. Um, (laughs) uh, And... I've been reading his series uh, over at Image Comics entitled Cowell, Chicago Organized Workers League, um, obviously based on his um, short film, The League. And uh, he announced that the comic was going to get a jazz soundtrack album uh, that at Joe Clark Chicago was going to be doing the music on this. Uh, Before we get too far into that, Looking at your website, you are from Chicago. Yes, sir. Uh, you're, you're still living there, which is good. Uh, <laughs> um, growing up, like, how did you get into music in general? What were you listening to as a kid? Well, actually, my parents met through music. Um, they were met at an open mic, of all things. And uh, so growing up, there was a lot of music around the house. They ended up starting a wedding band um, when, on days when they would have rehearsals, they would close the windows and pretend it was nighttime so I'd fall asleep. <laughs> and then uh, I'd usually wake up later in the evening. I'm still kind of a night owl because of it. But around the house, um, there was always classic jazz playing, classical music, um, rock. And whenever my mom wasn't home, my dad would always play more experimental things, stuff that, that uh, she might not enjoy as much. Everything from uh, Bulgarian folk singing to... Uh, Fusion from the 70s, more noise-based rock, Captain Beefheart, that kind of thing. So it was kind of a smorgasbord uh, growing up of music. Awesome. You said Bulgarian folk singing. All I can think of is Disney Channel's Phineas and Ferb. Oh, (laughs) more Bulgarian folk singing. Oh, no, less. Less Bulgarian (laughs) folk singing. Uh, all right. Um, what led you from listening to all this music as a kid and teenager and, you know, on into adulthood to want to go to school to become a composer, a, a, a creator of music? You know, the, the, the path to writing songs uh, actually came. My dad found a, a, a freeware program where you could write uh, little tunes in there. And so I just played with it and kept playing with it and kept playing with it. And eventually I had a bunch of stuff that I had written. And uh, thankfully, uh, one of my teachers in elementary school caught on that I was doing this, and she would take the pieces I wrote and project them onto a screen during the choir concerts, so sort of uh, something to cover the transition between groups. But I never really thought it was something you could get into. I, mm-hmm. That was kind of a mystery to me. I knew, uh, you know, I'd seen Amadeus and sort of figured that you had to have it or you didn't. And uh, so I really worked on playing trumpet. And I really doubled down on, on getting my trumpet chops together. And uh, one day in high school, there's a, a fantastic jazz trumpeter in Chicago named Orbert Davis. And uh, he was running a band of uh, high school kids uh, from the south suburbs. And, uh, and so I, I sort of asked him, like, well, I, I kind of want to get into music, but I only think I can teach because I'm not good at, like, I'm not just a, a wunderkind at this. And he says, well, why can't you just do it? You should do it if you want to do it. And so uh, I, went, I went for it. I went to DePaul University and uh, studied classical composition and jazz trumpet and got a master's degree in jazz comp. And I've been uh, playing and teaching ever since. What is your favorite part about sitting down and coming up with a new jazz tune? for your own purposes, whether it's a new album, whether it's a new 
collaboration with somebody? What's your favorite aspect of the creative process of coming up with a new tune? Oh man, that's a really good question. I think the the best part is when it's working. <laughs> Anything that is moving forward is a good feeling. Um, sometimes the, the tunes just show up. Like for example, a uh, Grey Raven on um, mm-hmm. the new album. It was the kind of thing where Kyle said we should come up with a theme for Grey Raven, and I sat down and played the first thing, sent it to him. He's like, "That's it, we're done." <laughs> <laughs> but it's not always like that. And uh, there's been a couple times that you know I've, uh, I wrote a, a tune for an album that's coming out by uh, Mark Hebert, the Barry Saxophone player on the album, and uh, it's only like a two minute long melody, but it took me about two months <laughs> to finish it because it just wasn't quite right. So uh, I guess to, to answer the question, the, the best part is when things start flowing, when you hit that state of flow and, you know, it, it's very natural. Absolutely. Um, looking at your website here, which will be linked in the interview post on geekcastradio.com, uh, your music has been performed by a bunch of people, uh, including Yo-Yo Ma. What was that experience like? That was really wild. Um Actually, Yo-Yo Ma has played a, played a couple things that I've written uh, through the Chicago Symphony Orchestra's uh, institute uh, that is sort of an outreach program for children. So uh, we did a flash mob once at the Thompson Federal Center. I worked with a, another composer, arranger named Cliff Colnott, and we did an arrangement of America the Beautiful. But uh, then Yo-Yo Ma has played a couple other things there. Um, it's been great. Um, it, 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 he's always such a busy guy. There's not a lot of face time. But, right. Uh, one of the, the best experiences was uh, I, we were we did this children's program called Once Upon a Symphony. In fact, we're about to start another round, n- not with Yo-Yo Ma, but another, mm-hmm. another show just this week. And uh, the theme was The Ugly Duckling. And I knew that Yo-Yo Ma would be playing, and one of the pieces they wanted to do was The Swan by Camille Sasson from the Carnival of the Animals, which is this gorgeous cello solo, just absolutely beautiful. And I'm freaking out that Yo-Yo Ma is going to be playing this cello solo. And, and so I, I write it and rewrite it and polish it and re-edit it. And, and I finally get it. And I'm you know, pouring my guts into this thing. And I finally get up to the show, and there's two cellists. Oh, no. But it's okay, because one of them's Ken Olsen of the Chicago Symphony, who's amazing. They're two amazing cellists. But as I'm looking at this, I'm thinking, you know, they're not both good to play it. And so uh, when it comes time for the show, Ken is the one who takes the solo part, which is cool. And Yo-Yo just improvises bird sounds over the whole thing. It's supposed to sound like a swan. Yeah. I couldn't even believe it. It just sounded like birds. It was, it was really cool. So sometimes, uh, and this is one thing I like about jazz and, and improvised music in general is sometimes what the musicians bring to the table is better than what you have on the page. So, that's <laughs> true. Uh, the other major person I notice in your biography on your on your website here is um, your horn arrangements can be heard on Kanye West and Malik Youssef's "Good Morning, Good Night." Talk about that experience! Like, I think this is the first person I've ever talked, actually, had an interview with that actually was that you know that close of a connection to Kanye West. Talk about that. <laughs> well, here's the thing, too. I'm I'm sorry to, to burst the bubble a bit. I'm, uh... I know I've never I've never met Kanye. I've never, oh, seriously, he never came to the, the sessions or anything. Um, I think it was, you know, Malik wrote a lot of the songs on 808s, you know, uh-huh. and, uh, and so I think there, there may have been some exchange there. Um, that group that was only the group that did the, the horn parts and the production on that. We had our own little thing for a while. It was called the 11th hour. And we called ourselves the 11th hour because we got a chance to record. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, did you hear those dings, by the way? That... No. All right, excellent. Um, so we called ourselves the 11th hour because a producer for one of the tracks got arrested. And we had 11 hours to replicate that track at a professional level. Oh, my God. In Los Angeles. And so there was a couple of us, and we tried our hands at it. And uh, I'm happy with how it turned out, but it's definitely not 
what I wanted to be doing in the long term. So <laughs> it's been kind of funny, though, because I, I, uh, I teach at DePaul University and Northwestern University. Mm. And uh, every once in a while, a student will bring up rap. And uh, I, I, can, I, I can't completely hang, but uh, I know a bit about rap. I was in the game, for, had a little <laughs> bit of skin in the game. And, uh, and so that sometimes surprises the students. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm sorry I can't share more colorful stories. Or... <laughs> so you weren't at the wedding. <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry, Mike. Oh, oh, <laughs> oh boy. Uh, all right. So let's get down to what we're actually here to talk about: the Cowell Sessions. Yep. How did this come about? You know what's funny? This is the I've been asked this question more and more frequently. And it's a mm-hmm. convoluted origin story to this. It, it's not nice and neat. It's not super heroic. Um, <laughs> I guess the, the first track that I wrote for this album was written even before there was a finalized script for the league. Because um, okay. Kyle had a story treatment. And we were talking. Well, let, let, let me backtrack just for a second. Absolutely. Were you the music guy on the league? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Why the hell isn't that on on iTunes? The the music by itself. That's a good question. <laughs> I love the music from that short. Oh, Come thanks, on, man. On. We nearly, oh, we nearly recorded that the one. Uh, well, the original uh, cow. Well, it was just the league theme. We, had, we yeah. it got adjusted, so we adjusted, <laughs> etc. But um, well, thank you. Uh, number one. And uh, so the thing that was interesting is because I was Kyle's senior project and uh, mm-hmm. you know, he's so ambitious in terms of the scale, I wanted to start writing, you know, just getting mood music the moment he said that the project was a go. And so right. I was still in school and uh, was writing stuff so that people could record over, I think it was Thanksgiving break. So we were recording and some musicians, I actually had to write the score sometimes I knew the drum player, uh, the percussionist, pardon me, um, had to leave very soon. And I didn't have the whole score finished. So I wrote all the drum parts before I finished everything else. So uh, some of those drum parts were written before I had any idea of the final layout of the scene. And we sort of worked around it. And uh, so anyway, with that in mind, uh, some of these tunes are, you know, almost a decade old, but they've been growing and gestating and, I've had uh, right. performances by different groups of the pieces because I've, I've tried. Uh, well, they've had a life outside of the film, which has been a, a pleasant surprise. And uh, and so Kyle and I have worked together on some things. And and Kyle's the kind of guy who, uh, for example, uh, he'll he'll call me up. He called me up a few years back and said, "I want the pow- the Go Go Power Rangers thing as my cell phone ring. Can you make that for me? <laughs> Can you get that? I'll go to the computer and and work out the music." But anyway, when Cowell first came out, he said, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to make a trailer. And I think it would be cool if we had a new like, track released every issue for the first five. And it, just un- it was just an unfeasible uh, timeline thing to work out at that time. But I, I did write music for the trailer. And that's where the original Grey Raven theme can be heard. Uh, from the uh, Grey Raven uh, is a character in the book, podcast listeners. Right. Um, and, uh, and from there, I thought we were done. But then in, in June or July, I get an email that says, hey, how long does it take to write and record a, a jazz album and get it released? <laughs> and I said, we don't have enough time, so let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah. And so from there, uh, Kyle was working his way through the first five books and I was working my way through the album and every once in a while we'd touch base. And Kyle's mentioned a few times that uh, he spent so much time in, in the world of Cowell that it's, it's mutated a little bit. And he and Alec uh-huh. have had to say, oh, wait a second, is that, is that character still doing this or not? <laughs> and so that, that was kind of interesting seeing that development as we're writing, we're both writing our, our uh, you know, I, I'm writing the album and he's writing the book. Right. So that, that's been re- really fulfilling. And so then, yeah, we, uh, I booked uh, a session in August and it was out by October. 
Yeah, it came out the week that the. <laughs> I think you guys really did plan this. Oh, we absolutely came... did. It came out like the yeah no it did. Uh, it came out the week that the volume one trade collection came out. <laughs> that was by design. In fact, I, I think that was that was what what Kyle said. If we can't do one for each issue, we'll have to do it when all five are first published for the first. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, um, I've listened to the nine tracks. I reviewed it on geekcastradio.com in written form. Yeah, thank. You. It's a, it's amazing. Oh, I'm glad to dig it. It's awesome. Just you know, throw it on in the background. I, you know, I, I just cracked open the trade to read it again uh, while listening to the album because we, um, uh, this week, this past Wednesday, because this will be going up on Friday, this past Wednesday, I just released my review uh, podcast for the pullback for Cowell Volume 1. So it's kind of, again, <laughs> an, an, another big plan. You know, we already reviewed the comic, so let's let's go ahead and, you know, talk to Joe and and uh, and, 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 and talk about the Cowell sessions. Um, but reading it while listening to the music really adds a hell of a lot more. This could almost be a TV series. Huh? It really could, like you guys could do like a YouTube series or something. You don't even have to go to the regular networks. But I mean, I know that would take up a lot of time and a lot of production and everything else. Well, but... I'm I'm going to refrain from commenting. <laughs> right, obviously, it's you know, it's 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 Kyle's work. I would have loved to have had him here tonight, but uh, that that could not be helped. Um, but it's one of those things where, as I was listening to the tracks and as I was reading the book, I'm like, wow, this stuff really matches up. Like, um, oh. Forgive me. I just reviewed it, and you'd think I'd remember it. Um, oh, that's all right. When they're, um, when they're, I think it's an issue two when uh, Eclipse and Grant are chasing down. Yeah, it's in issue two. It's when uh, Grant gets shot. Yeah. Um, when they're chasing down the guy, uh, you know, Sparks immediately came to mind. <laughs> it's like, that's good chase music right there. And then when uh, when John Pierce is doing his investigation, obviously, uh, track three investigations, you know, comes into play. And I thought that was really well done. I really do hope you guys do another one um, after the next arc, however long the next arc is going to be. Well, thanks. I think, you know, we, we were, we kept uh, joking about when we were coming with the title. Um, I kept saying, well, let's just call it Cowl Sessions Volume 1 of 20. <laughs> and, uh, or Volume 1, you know. And uh, so, yeah, I, I, man, if, if Kyle's up for it, I think uh, I'd be up for it. And if, uh, if uh, Sparks and Shadows, our label, is interested in it, I think uh, I, I, I can definitely speak for myself and say I, I, I would love to keep doing this. <laughs> Absolutely. I like the idea of releasing, I, I, in my own music, uh -huh. there's something, when I put out my first album, Lush, it was for a big mm. band, and we did traditional media in terms of releasing CDs, and uh, we worked with a lot of really talented, awesome, old uh, jazz media guys, and that was a great experience, um, but at the same time, I, I would be talking to Kyle, and he's putting out a new book every month. And yeah. it's just a different kind of culture. You talk. Oh, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> when you you put out the first album, for example, um, I know you and I were talking previously, and I had to stop and think about when, what year it actually came out, because we spent so much time with the the pre-release right. and all the planning, and you have to mail out the physical copies. So it's a different kind of pace of things. So man, there was something something really fun about working on the comic book turnaround schedule. There's, there's an energy to it and an urgency, which is, uh, it reminds me of working in live theater sometimes where you just have to make a decision. Yeah, there we go. Absolutely. Cause you know, I mean, I, it, it depends on the series. It depends on the publisher, but you know, sometimes you go month to month work. You know, I've, I've heard interviews with, with writers and artists on comics that, Sometimes they go month to month writing story arcs. Sometimes they go sit and write and do all the work for, you know, two or three or four issues that are coming once a month down the line. So it just really depends. But um, Oh, yeah, totally. 
I mean, honestly, like after uh, I would kill, not literally, but ah. I would kill for a soundtrack after each arc of like, seriously, Cowl is probably one of my favorite non superhero non friend because technically it's okay it's semi non superhero when I, when I say <laughs> non superhero i mean it's not dc's it's not marvel's it, it it's not you know what i mean it's sure it's not the... when i think of a superhero comic i think of batman superman you know wonder woman green lantern there are superheroes in it, but it's not that kind of narrative for sure. Right, ex right, exactly. I mean, this to me is a period piece comic that is about a superhero labor union in 60s Chicago, and that's unlike anything any publisher is doing right now. Absolutely. Um, and so when I say, you know, it's not a superhero comic, I mean, it's not with DC or Marvel. It's not a franchise comic like, uh, you know... Uh, He-Man Masters Universe licenses out to DC or, oh, you know, yeah. uh, Transformers licenses out to IDW. It, it's a creator-owned comic and, uh, man, like, I, I I know this would kill Kyle, <laughs> but I wish, I wish Cowl was a weekly series. I really do. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I know that would kill him, but it, it is just <laughs> that damn good. Um, <laughs> uh, and it's, and the, you know, having music to go along with it. Um, what's going to be interesting for me is, mm -hmm. as issues six, seven, eight, nine, ten, whatever, come out to see if the soundtrack can fit some of the some of the upcoming scenes that Kyle is going to write and and Rod Rice is going to you know Kyle, and Alec, and Rod are going to work on and write and illustrate and all that stuff to see if it also fits with what's coming after. And Alec Siegel, don't forget Alec. Alex. Yeah, I did. Oh, yeah, I, said, I, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I said, ah. I said Kyle, Alec, and Rob. Um, <laughs> Forgive me. You, you yes. can edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> um, but because uh, it it really is going to be interesting. Because I know you, as you already said, he specifically asked you to write this based around the first arc, which is Principles of Power, and it's going to be interesting if heaven forbid you don't get to do another one, <laughs> if this music can fit in any other arc after this one yeah that's almost uh i don't want to say a rorschach test but see how i see how our minds process the two that's actually been part of the, the joy of it is it's not it's not a temporal one-to-one -one kind of thing where you're there's a matching up to per scene i know i had a couple right. people asking me like is there going to be a sign when i should start playing it but um one, one of the inspirations to me was uh this 1957 uh, Mancini album, the the music of Peter Gunn, oh. and most people know the theme, the dong 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 that part. But mm -hmm. the whole album after that, after the the main theme, is a bunch of stuff that just sort of sets the mood. Uh, stuff that um, wasn't always performed in its entirety on the series, and in some cases, and this is what really intrigued me, was never played on the series at all, and wasn't even written for that. It was just wow. you know, yeah, it was just Mancini's idea of like the mood of the scene and uh and the mood of the story and to me you know i i like thinking musically in, in general but that just suggested such a big world if there's there's soundtracks for for scenes and stories that aren't even there yet you know and so i don't know it's gonna be interesting the other thing that's gonna be interesting is book six is being done in the style of an old silver age book and yeah. uh it's gonna be a standalone so um Yep. Makes me want to pull out some of the soundtrack from the original League, some of the trombone stuff we did with a real nasally newsreel quality. Oh my god. <laughs> you have you have to find a way to get that on I there's gotta be a way you guys can submit that to iTunes. Just put it to, it it already exists, correct? Uh yeah. I think uh I'd have to go digging through the archives or maybe maybe Kyle is such an organized guy, he probably is is two t two clicks away from finding it, but <laughs> um, I, yeah. I mean, seriously, like I would buy that in a heartbeat. I, I was actually sitting here at my computer waiting, <laughs> uh, you know, on the uh, on the twenty seventh going into the. I was sitting here at eleven forty five, just waiting for midnight to click over here here in the Eastern time zone, just waiting so I could just hit that buy button. Oh, um, thanks, man. It's just to make a guy feel it, good. 
That sounds so wrong. <laughs> come on, come on. <laughs> I know what you mean. But yeah. Uh, but no, I mean, it's, you know, people need to take more notice of this series and of, of, of this album. I mean, I know I've seen, I think I've seen several other people review it uh, online. I don't remember where exactly, but, you know, just do a search for the cowls, the, the cowl sessions. And I'm sure, um, you know, reviews will pop up there's more that are coming too that, that's one of the nice things about doing a, a digital only release mm -hmm. we, we can roll it out a little bit it feels real nice absolutely um will the now i know the 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 artwork for this one is um is very blaze uh heavy since he is on the cover <laughs> <laughs> that is true um <laughs> and i do think that opening track uh the opening track which is entitled blaze um i do think that fits the very first battle scene in issue one of the series so i mean it does it does work where you can put this on and listen to it track one to track nine and at least through the first two or three issues you'll be set for music um, <laughs> then you put it on loop and you'll be set for the last two. Yeah, it, that's true. It's like Dark that's Side true. of the Rainbow. You ever done that <laughs> <Yeah>. one? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just leave, yeah. Leave it on loop. <laughs> so what came first, the instrumental version of Chicago or the sung version with Rhea Yarbrough? You know, when uh, when we first talk about doing an arrangement of Chicago, which honestly, I, I've wanted to work with it. I, I just found out it was in the public domain. So, so uh -huh. that was really nice to find that out. Um, Kyle and I both were like, oh, this would make a really cool vocal thing. And we loved it, Rhea on it, but uh, we weren't sure if it was going to work out schedule-wise. You know, she, she's, uh, she's in high demand. And so the challenge was to write an arrangement that worked both as an instrumental and as a vocal. And we mm -hmm. didn't know until about a week before the recording session. <laughs> so... Uh, even passing out the music to musicians, I had these parts, uh, all these notes written in there that, you know, if, if there's a vocalist, you'll have to lay out here because she'll be singing a part. And uh, right. it was it was only the, a couple of days before the session, I was able to contact everybody. I'm like, we have a vocalist. But by that point, I, um, you know, I'd gotten so familiar to listening to the instrumental and had that in my head uh, that we decided to leave them both in. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm happy with how it turned out, though. I hate to say it, but I think her her vocal version is the superior version. Oh no! Don't are you kidding me? You know, it was she's awesome. Number one, and yeah. uh, number two, we're lucky to have her. You know. Yeah. And uh, I mean, when I get down to Chicago, the instrumental version, I'm like, wait, it, it, there's something missing here. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the other thing too, talking about reading it with the the mm -hmm. book, I think that that was that was something that that I've found. You know, reading and listening to it, it's kind of nice to have it return is uh, a little bit more subdued at the end, because mm -hmm. you know by the end of the uh, of the book, without giving too much away, you know the mood has changed, but it's changed in a way that the status quo is somewhat maintained. So right. musically, we're trying to you know evoke that as a as a kind of musical metaphor. So hopefully that works out in that sense. Absolutely. Uh, what other things are you working on now that Cowl Sessions Volume 1 is out? Oh, man, it's been a, a real uh, busy but fun uh, couple couple weeks since <laughs> since that album came out, because <laughs> it's only been a couple weeks. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just finished a project with uh, two fantastic trumpeters, uh, Marquise Hill, who just a few days ago, uh, won the Polonius Monk Jazz Trumpet Competition in Los Angeles. Um, just a crazily nice guy who's a monstrous player. Real warm, soft, energetic, intelligent sound. Um, and he was doing a project with uh, one of his mentors, a trumpeter named John Faddis, who used to perform with Dizzy Gillespie. You know, mm -hmm. this, this beast. So we, we just did a big show together, and uh, I'm finishing up a... A, a, a series of arrangements for the Chicago Symphony Orchestra's uh, children's series. We're getting that uh, started this week, but I'll be finished uh, hopefully soon. And uh, the Chicago Sinfonietta, another orchestra 
in the area. And uh, yeah, I've got some of my own projects I'm working on, something um, also Chicago themed. So uh, I think there's a little bit more to pull from there, but uh, that should be coming together soon. Yeah. Very awesome. Very awesome. All right. I think that's going to do it, really. Um, Absolutely. Cal Sessions. It's amazing, people. Go listen to it. Go get the first tra- the first uh, trade of the series. Uh, you're going to love it. Uh, where can the people interact with you online, sir? I am at Twitter, at Joe Clark Chicago. And uh, you can follow me on Facebook, also Joe Clark Chicago, and JoeClarkBigBand.com. Awesome, awesome. Well, that's going to do it for us here on GeekCast Radio and Inside the Pull Bag. Coming up next week, we're going to be talking about another image series. It would be interesting to see if jazz music could fit to this series. I don't think it will, but <laughs> next next week, ladies and gentlemen, you're going to have to listen to this episode of the podcast in a closet away from everybody because we are talking about Image Comics series by Matt Fraction <laughs> entitled Sex Criminals. So we'll be talking about that next week. Huge thanks to Joe Clark. It's been amazing, dude, talking to you. Oh, thanks, Mike. This was great. I appreciate it. All right. We will catch you next time. Shut down Ooh, on State Street, that great street. I just want to say, they do things they don't do on Broadway. You have the time, the time of your life. I just saw. Dance with his wife in Chicago.